Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Prabhu. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the Monks Podcast once again. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Yes, yeah, so I started traveling a few months ago and uh, I couldn't have time to do many podcasts. I thought we'll resume now. And so I thought today we could discuss on a topic which we have addressed in our previous podcast and we also discussed one-to-one, but we are not devoted a podcast to it. That is the te- resolving the tension between the letter of scripture and the spirit of scripture. Like we have the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And I'll just give a bit context of where I'm coming from. How basically within our tradition itself, there are there is both the conceptual and practical example of this. Right now the 10th canto is going on. Our Damodarila is going on, so we made it on the Krishna's pastimes. So there is the Yagik Brahman pastime where the when the Brahmanas they are following the letter of the law, but they forget to offer to Krishna. Well, the whole sacrifice is meant for Krishna. So then that is a classic example of sticking to the letter and forgetting the spirit, and they realize it. And within our tradition, also there is the concept of Niyamagraha. That in the Upadesha Amrut Nectar of Instruction is talked about how. Niyam, one may hold on to the rule so strongly mm. that one Inadical. forget its purpose. Yeah. So I had three broad questions which we could discuss one way. Of course, one is why why may there be a tension between letter and spirit? And second is who decides what is the spirit behind the letter? And third would be that are there any contemporary examples of Shila Prabhupada and in our situations? where we may need to resolve this difference between letter and spirit properly. So very good. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful topic. Yes. Yeah, so you can start if you like, why might there be a difference you feel between letter and spirit uh, at all? Shouldn't the letter be also meant to fulfill the spirit itself? Well, uh, first of all, words, words on a page don't cry. They don't laugh. They don't feel emotion. You know, they're they're words on a page. Um, Bhakti is about unleashing the emotion and the relationships and and the important things that lie beneath the words. And um, Beautiful. Scripture, scripture. We, well, we have two understandings of scripture. One is, if you will, from a high theological perspective, we say that scripture is itself non-different from Krishna, but Krishna and Krishna's words are the same. So we we worship scripture. You can put the Bhagavad Gita on an altar and worship it. Mm. So. And, and, you know, in that sense, the you know the 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 letter of the law, <laughs> if you will, uh, in uh, in in uh, in Vaishnav understanding, uh, is is God Himself. You know? Yes. Uh, so, from from that philosophic or theological perspective, the letter of the law reigns supreme, and and you cannot. Uh, compromise the letter of the law. You cannot uh, misappropriate the teachings of Scripture because you're uh, disrespecting Krishna himself. You know, there's that verse in Bhagavad Gita, Yashastra Vidim Vudsrija, you know, those, <laughs> those who disobey the teachings of Scripture uh, come to ruin. But then, of course, this is the amazing thing about Bhagavad Gita. There's always Krishna is always presenting two sides, <laughs> and sometimes they seem very contradictory. Then elsewhere in the Gita, he tells Arjuna, "Well, once you've come out of your confusion, you won't you won't really be thinking too much about what the letter of the law is all about." Yeah. You'll be second chapter. Second yeah. chapter says that one of the characteristics of a self-realized person is "idate moha kalilam buddhirvatitarishyati." Yeah. Like you'll go, it, it talks about your not the mind going out of the forest of illusion, it talks about the intelligence going out of the forest of illusion. Yes. And then you will not be disturbed by what you have heard even in scripture before. Right. And or what you will hear in the future, because that's beautiful. So both sides are there in Bhagavad Gita itself. 
it's 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 amazing throughout Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes uh, karma is put down by Krishna. Sometimes karma is exalted by Krishna. You know, by performing your duties, you can come to me. You know, I mean, sometimes desire is put down, and then elsewhere in the Gita, Krishna says, you know, have desire, you know, for me, you know, and and uh, um, um, uh, I, I am I am desire that is not contrary to uh, scriptural uh, injunctions. So, so Gita plays both sides from the middle uh, many times. Mm -hmm. um, still, yeah. you're, you're, we're, we're discussing a very particular issue here, and that is the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. So, how, how to know? How to know which one is right? You know, do, do we just, and as you said, how do we know that we've properly interpreted the letter of the law even if we wish to be very conservative you know and just do what's you know, what's taught in scripture how do we know that we've understood you know very often you'll you'll have a a scriptural injunction in one place that goes in one direction and a scriptural injunction in another place and sometimes it's a matter of your own adhikara it's a matter of your own progress you know, think of it like this. Um, here in New York, I, I I love going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's it's this wonderland of <laughs> of art and sculpture and and design. And uh, I remember going as a young boy. I'm a New Yorker, so I've been going to museums in New York since I was a kid. And you go to the museum and you look at. Uh, works by the impressionists or or you know the 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 fauvists or you, you you can look at any number of paintings and when you're young you might appreciate the colors and the themes when you grow and mature you look at that same painting and it has a whole different meaning you perhaps you have some you've because you've lived your life and and the 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 statement of a particular painting or sculpture with regard to the nature of love, the nature of uh, our humanness, takes on a whole other meaning. So the, the painting has not changed, mm. but we have grown and evolved, and therefore our reaction to that painting has changed. The same is true for teachings from Scripture. I remember when I, I was a young devotee in London back in 1970, and we were reading about kama, right? you know, lust or cravings or you know mm. desires. For me, as a nineteen-year-old back then, kama meant, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and that was it. <laughs> that, that was like, yeah, all right. If I can control those things, I'm good. It, it wasn't until later in life, you know, when I married and had children and career and so on that i realized wow even the pursuit of knowledge can be kama you know if it's done for selfish interests um, artistic creation can be kama you know if you're doing it for self-aggrandizement mm -hmm. so my just understanding just to, sorry just to reiterate this point i, yes. I also felt that uh, Sometimes when you use the word material, this word material desires, material is actually too huge a category to be helpful sometimes. Because even within mm -hmm. our tradition, there is sattva guna, raju guna, tamu guna, goodness, passion, ignorance. So are, are all the desires that we call as material exactly the same? So, so, so in that sense, if uh, somebody wants like drug, drug and sex is one thing, but somebody wants to take care of their family. They may not be, they want to take care of the environment. They may not have directly God in the picture or any things after within the next life in the picture. But they that cannot be simply dismissed as a material desire. So within our tradition itself, then Sattva Rajas Tamas is there. Yeah. And yeah. back to your point, I said that over the years, we could say that even if we are not practicing spirituality, and especially if we are practicing spirituality, 
we also evolve a little bit in our modes. Yeah, that's so that it. could also affect when I see a painting, when I am, when I see this, what to speak of painting, even like people sometimes watch the same movie or read the same novel in their twenties and they read it in the fifties or sixties. It's a very different experience. Yes. And the same is true for our reading of uh, the letter of the law in scriptures. You yes. Know? That's the, true. The, the letter may not have changed, but we've changed and the world around us has changed, you know, so its application is different. I just so, thought, uh, yesterday had this, I had this realization in one sense. I was speaking on the Damodar Ashtak and we sing the Damodar Ashtak and offer a lamp. So in the past, I have spoken frequently when I'm traveling, people ask me to speak, but two, three years when I was in the pandemic, I didn't speak on it. So what I was speaking now, and I was just going through the notes of what I had spoken five years ago. I felt it's so different. It's only a 10-15% similarity. <laughs> so yeah. it is. So we can say that uh, going back to your earlier point, that sometimes scripture, if you consider higher level, that scripture is non-different from Krishna. That means often scripture becomes like a you could say takeoff point or a departure point for us to, to see our own experiences in Krishna's light. Could you phrase something like that? Yes, that's very nice. I mean, Krishna is not static. Krishna is always evolving and changing. And, you know, there's a dynamic to his relationships with his devotees. And if scripture is non different from Krishna, then mm. scripture must also be evolving and uh, uh, sh uh, uh, shifting according to the circumstances and the environment <clears throat> so that that's one consideration you know. mm. um yes so, yes. so, so, so this is very evolving, real some scripture evolving might seem a bit too radical for people because they say that scripture is uh is uh, is a fixed body of knowledge but i think we can say that we have the tradition of the bhagavatam being just four verses first and then 18,000 verses in the Shukdev to Shukdev Goswami and it's said to be much bigger for the Devtas. So the idea of uh, scripture itself relating with different people in different ways is very much a part of our tradition. Yes, and in fact, if you're too orthodox in your understanding of the letter of the law, then you're actually... Um, limiting Krishna. You're, you're saying that uh, Krishna is confined to this one dimension of the teaching, this one interpretation of the verse, this one sense of its meaning. And, um, and that's a, a misunderstanding of Krishna's nature. Krishna is very dynamic and Krishna's teachings are very, very dynamic as yeah. well. Again, there um, is a chapter is Mahaprabhu gives 64 meanings of the Atma Ram verse. Mm. So here yes. we are making a very interesting point that it's uh, we could say this is the letter of scripture and we are here. So it is not it you, we could say it's both ways that because we are changing and we are evolving, so we find different things in scripture. But we can say a scripture if it's, it's if a scripture is Krishna. And Krishna's energy is expanding. Krishna is a living, loving person. So you could say scripture itself may reveal different things to us. So there's, you could say there's dynamism at both sides. It's not just our change that leads to our perceiving scripture in different ways. So what right. I'm trying to say is that this dynamism is not extrinsic to scripture. It can be, we can say it's, it is not extrinsic depending on the reader. It can also be intrinsic to scripture itself. Yes, and uh, of course we're talking now on a uh, on a rather abstract level, you know, yeah, course, theological yeah. level. But there's also a very practical uh, context as well. Um, you know, for the, the, there's a can what if if, let's take for example a Prabhupada's uh, controversial statements, right? Mm -hmm. So. Is, do we respect the letter of the law? Do we take Prabhupada's words on face value? And what he said, that's how it is. 
Or do we allow ourselves to say, well, maybe there was some cultural influence there. He, you know, his use of language was very particular. To Do we try to understand it in, you might say, a relativistic way? And, you know, for more conservative members of our society, the, the contextual argument, in other words, putting Prabhupada's words within the context of the discussion and the purpose that he he meant it to have, it's overshadowed by a broader consideration. And that broader consideration is what we might call um, originalism. Uh, in, in, in law, originalism means uh, that um, the codified words, whether it's scripture, like we're talking about now, or uh, in, in the Constitution of the United States, or in the rulings of the Supreme Court, or, or in the writings of Srila Prabhupada, right? uh, those words have a fixed sense that is the same today as when they were written. That, that's the originalist position, yeah. right? Supporters of... Huh? I think there is a, a very, uh, very vibrant or even vehement debate going on in America about the Constitution. Now, whether oh, we yes. have originalist understanding or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. What is the other side? No, this is real. This is very practical. The subject that you've brought up for our <laughs> discussion today is front page news here. It's front page news. I mean, really? And if you want to you know, apply it directly to ISKCON, you could say that... The, Originalism in ISKCON uh, uh, leans heavily on on reading Prabhupada's words literally and taking them on face value, right? Um, ISKCON originalists <laughs> um, would maintain, for example, that what is morally or ethically right um, does not change over time. Prabhupada's uh, intentions do not change over time, right? And consequently, his words have to be accepted as they were originally intended without attempting to uh, uh, reconcile them with, you know, changing ethical or moral ideas, you know. That, mm. And... and you know, there's a regulating purpose behind that. I, I'm, we shouldn't dismiss that completely, right? Let me give you an example, if I if I may, from yes. we're talking about the Supreme Court here in the United States, right? So the late Justice um, Scalia hmm. uh, was a, an originalist, right? Meaning um, he he took the words of the Constitution literally, and and they were. He, he did that in some measure because he assumed that the liberals on the court <clears throat> would have a hard time holding back from being judicial activists for their particular points of view, and they needed to be controlled. You can begin to make the uh, connections with the history of ISKCON as well. <clears throat> And that's an assumption that held true for a lot of Scalia's career. You know, the, the Supreme Court, which was weighted toward liberals in, in his day, extended constitutional safeguards to cover women's rights and rights of gays and lesbians and the right to die right? There, and, and other determinations by the courts and the originalist idea the conservative idea Scalia's idea was that this was not the intention of the founding fathers right if they had wanted that kind of broader application they would have said so right so in ISKCON that's like saying if Prabhupada had wanted women gurus uh, he would have been more emphatic about it right so, you know, both sides have their challenges. You know, the, what you might say, the, the originalist idea and the contextualist idea, contextualizing uh, a scriptural teaching or Prabhupada's teachings with the world 
we live in today. They they both have problems, you know. <clears throat> but again, I think yeah, okay. What we touched on earlier is important, namely, what did Prabhupada mean? You know, just I, th I think Maharaj, just to go yeah. back to your point, it is yeah. It is sometimes what happens is that, like, we may want to find justification for our own ideas within a book that is a source of authority. So, yes. like, you consider yes. Prabhupada was sometimes quite critical of uh, Gandhiji's commentary on the Gita, where he said that nonviolence is the core teaching of the Gita. Yes, the Gita is taught, this mentioned Ahimsa as a desirable quality. But we can't really say that that is the essential message of the Gita. It is a good value. But so, so he wanted as a strategy, as a political strategy, as a principled stand, right. Ahimsa is fine. But to claim that it is the core teaching of the Gita, that is, that is, we could say, it's almost like we are not reading from scripture, we are reading into scripture. You know, what we want yeah, to find yeah, there. That's a, that's a good distinction. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So that is one extreme which we want to avoid. But if we say everything has to be in the letter of the scripture itself, then the application of scripture, applicability of scripture would itself become very limited. Because then, because scripture is spoken at a particular time in history. And so if, say, there is no mention of phones and internet in scripture, so can we not use that at all in Krishna's service? Because there is no mention for that. So the, I think the letter of the scripture would be very limiting to the applicability of scripture. If, if we if limit the ambit of scripture to solely its letter. But then on the other hand, if we try to read our own teachings, then it would, our own ideas, then scripture may not uh, retain any intrinsic authority at all. It may just become whatever anybody wants to propagate using it. So as you said, both sides, the extremes are there and we need to find a balance. Yeah. You I know. hope I didn't interrupt you. I just wanted to... Just no, 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 no. No, this is... Look, we, I love our discussions. That's wonderful. Um, you, you make good points. Um, <clears throat> like Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, my heart goes out to that very, very large number of people, sincere people, who are trying to be devotees, they're trying to be Krishna conscious, you know, they, they, they believe in this, they, they love it, you know, they, their, their friends are now from the devotee community, their, you know, their lives have been affected somehow, but they, they, they don't know how to do it, you know, because of this confusion between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law you know we're not supposed to drink coffee well that's between you and me most of the devotees i know drink coffee um we're not supposed to do a lot of things can you avoid eating out you know you're not supposed to eat food that are that's prepared by non devotees i don't know about you but here in new york <clears throat> it's pretty rough trying to, you know, just survive on meals that have been prepared <clears throat> in a devotional environment. I mean, if you if you've got a job, it's that's a th hard thing to do. Yeah, you know, there there are adjustments that are required. Um, and a sincere person wonders how far do I go before I've crossed the line too far? You know, when, how far is too far? in interpreting the letter of the law, right? So this is a very, very practical, very, very practical thing. Um, and um, most of the people I know, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, um, the, the difficulty for them in their spiritual life is not the letter of the law. It, it's the spirit of the law. They understand the letter of the law, you know, philosophically they get what it means, you know, karma, gunas, this, this, you know, they have some sense of that. That's not what causes them difficulties in life. What causes them difficulties in life is they're not making enough money to 
put food on the table for their family or they want to put their daughter through college and they don't have the money for it it's too expensive or their mother has health issues and can't afford health insurance or i mean you know real life issues you know the the real stuff <laughs> of life you know or people are just scared they're scared by the tone of the country there's so much divisiveness you know you and i have talked about that how much hostility that hostility there is now mm. you know, where did that come from it's horrible it's just horrible you know that there's no gentlemanly behavior anymore it's all backbiting and and uh name calling and and um you know manipulating of the system to make sure that your party gets into office and you don't care about hearing anyone else out all you know is that they're from the other party and who cares for them there's this antipathy there's this anger this hostility that's um that's tragic you know kali yuga is winning right now mm. you know and she's doing a great job of it um so we need to pay attention to the spirit of the law as well we can't draw a hard line and say no this is it and you either do this or you're out i mean you know you can take that position and feel good that you're being you know very staunch as a devotee and you can watch the movement just shrivel up and die i mean Prabhupada, when he came, I'm talking now for us first generation devotees, he was very good in making sure we understood the letter of the law, and then he was very good at under, making sure we understood the spirit of the law. Mm. He, he bent over backwards, bent over backwards to make sure that people could have a chance, you know, to progress spiritually. It's a difficult thing to do. So that's my heart goes out to those people who are, you know, not struggling with high theological issues of, you know, Saguna Brahman versus Nirguna Brahman, or, you know, what is the actual definition of Kaivalya and, you know, union and uh, that philosophy is nice, but, you know, that's not what makes devotees generally. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of the law, the spirit of the teachings. And Prabhupada's spirit was very, very broad-minded, very sensitive to other people. Mm. So I appreciate the need for orthodoxy. You know, the, the conservatives, people who would just follow the letter of the law, well, in a sense, they're trying to protect the tradition. They don't want to see everything dissolve because it's being misinterpreted by liberal devotees like me. You know, I'm very liberal. I'm a very liberal-minded devotee, you know. And, and, and for me, I, I, can't, uh, I can't insist that people do anything that they think the way I think or behave the way I behave, you know. I, 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 I know from my own experience, that's not what made me a devotee. <laughs> what made me a devotee was being with people who had the spirit of the teachings, you know, and it was beautiful to see. You know, they were very compassionate, very friendly. Mm. So, so we, could we say this, that uh, when we talk, even about those who are wanting to preserve the tradition, I think everybody wants to preserve the tradition. Even the liberals want to preserve, maybe they focus more on preserve the uh, relevance or the accessibility of the tradition. Whereas we could say the conservatives want to preserve the fidelity of the tradition overall, how it's connected with the past. But overall, uh, to what extent? I earlier talked about, you know, we are reading into scripture, our own ideas, our own agendas. That is one thing which we could say is unhealthy. But then we have our own natures. And to some extent, 
no, I don't rely. I agree with everything the neuroscience says, because there's a lot of psycho babble claims which are there. But it does seem that the brains of people who are conservative, the brains of people who are liberal, are somewhat differently wired. So some people think in terms of preserving what is existing, and some people think of expanding or connecting with what is what is present, what is the need of the present. So we could say let's assume that the liberal and the conservative perspectives are just individual ways of looking at things and different people have different natures. So we can't, in one sense, deny our nature and we will naturally approach scripture from a particular perspective. So mm -hmm. are there some ways we can differentiate between, say, approaching scripture according to our nature and approaching scripture according to our own agenda? Now, just using the word agenda creates a bias in it. I'm giving like a <laughs> but in general, uh, is are there some broad ways of differentiating? Like, like what I have read, say, for example, in America, that wow. there are some now feminism it has its historical validity in uh, as a as a has a reaction to say male chauvinism, exploitation, abuse, and other things. But say there are some feminist churches I have heard about how they they depict Jesus with female bodily parts because they say why should Jesus be a man? Now we, yeah. we could say that this is this is this may be going a bit too far. There is similarly <laughs> <laughs> you might say that. <laughs> so there are some things which are okay. You can find space for yourself within scripture and for yourself and your nature, but using scripture to pursue one's own agenda. Those are two different things. Yeah. Look, we have our equivalents also in, in Gaudiya Vaishnava history when you come to the Sahajya sects. They also have their own somewhat dubious interpretation of, of things. Um, I, it's, you raise a good point, and I think it's important to ask why does someone have a particular orientation? Why is someone so hellbent on interpreting things in a fundamentalist way, in an originalist way, right? Where does that come from? Why is it that this devotee, they're both sincere devotees, this devotee is so fixated on, you know, the original meaning of things, and this devotee, is perfectly willing to um, see a variety of in interpretations. I don't think it's inherent in the texts. I think it's inherent in the psychology of the individual. You know, okay. If someone if someone was brought up with very disciplinarian parents, you know spare the rod, spoil the child kind of thing. You know, if, if they were real disciplinarians and strict, well, that person will have a particular kind of reaction to authority and may not want to interpret scripture very strictly because it brings back memories of maybe they were beaten as children for being disobedient or maybe it hardened them i know i'll tell you i think i can share this with you without breaking confidentiality you know that i'm a part of iskan resolve so i do some mediation sometimes yes one mediation i was asked to facilitate was between a former gurukul student and an administrator from the Gurukul where this person attended. And this person was beaten as, as a child. So in the mediation, uh, which was already in itself extraordinary that these two people would be willing to sit down and talk. I thought that was a very brave thing. The question came up, why, if, if you accept this description that you behaved in this way why did you behave 
in that way? What was it that led you to think that that was okay? And the response came back, well, I, I was brought up in a, in a military family, you know, where my parents and siblings all served in the armed forces. From early childhood, that's all that I knew. That's how you learned. You learned by strict discipline, and uh, sometimes it meant corporal punishment. So that's how I was brought up. You know, it's almost like the, the story of Magari the hunter. You know, why are you half killing animals? Well, my parents did it. <laughs> so it, it's not the scripture, it's the psychology of the individual that very often determines their behavior. Right? Mm, true. So <clears throat> that doesn't, that's not meant to be an excuse for doing wrong. You know, if, if someone's being abusive, they should stop that. But it is to say <clears throat> that sometimes we can have a deeper insight into why people interpret teachings the way they do if we have some sense of them as persons, as individuals, as human beings. And... Uh, you know, sometimes there's a misinterpretation. For example, Prabhupada would, would um, go on morning walks with his PhD disciples, and sometimes he would say, you know, scientists are rascals. Mm -hmm. Well, here he is with his own students who are scientists, right? Is he including them? Is he calling them rascals? <laughs> you know? So, you know, to understand... Prabhupada's mood and his intentions, sometimes you really do need to bring it back to what was happening around him at that moment. Otherwise, if you take what he said out of context, it'll have a very, very different sense. You know, there were, there were times uh, he would take a, an adversarial position just to get us talking. He'd say, there is no God. Now you discuss. Mm. Well, if you take it out of context, it makes it sound like he's saying there's no God. <laughs> so, yeah, we have to be careful. We have to be very careful when we deal with the, the, the letter and the spirit of the law. There are a lot of things ar around that. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up as our subject today. It's an important subject, and we should discuss it more. Mm. Yes, yes. So, if we say that ultimately, we, if there are different people who are different natures, and that's what uh, will make them see scripture differently, we cannot, there is a certain amount of irreducibility to human nature also, which is implicit in our understanding of, uh, of, uh, of, how, of scriptural teachings. So that would mean that certain amount of scripture would be uh, would be how should I put it? Certain amount of diversity of opinion on scripture would be just unavoidable. So are there parameters which we can have to at least uh, minimize the conflict or to make it uh, less make the conflict less acrimonious or better? Yeah, um, act from a place of compassion, act from a place of love, act from a place of wanting to serve people rather than defeating them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very candid with you, and I, and I think it's okay to talk about this. Um, There, there are different camps in the discussion about exhibits for the Museum of the Vedic Planetarium. Mm. Now, the temple, it's a huge, you know, $100 million, I don't know how much money now, to build this ninth wonder of the world. I mean, this temple is so incredible. It's going to be on every tourist's bucket list. 
you know, after you've seen the pyramids of Giza and after you've seen the Taj Mahal, you must go and see the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium. It's the biggest Hindu temple in the world. It's this amazing construction. They're building boat ports and airports and, you know, they're expecting 10 million visitors a year or some incredible number like that. Right next door to the main temple is a side building, six stories, that is the museum mm. of the Vedic Planetarium. And it's meant to show the Puranic and Siddhantic universes. It's meant to describe through electronic computer exhibits how you're not the body, you'll see yourself morphing into different shapes and so on. Very exciting. But there are different perspectives here, you know. One side thinks that we don't care about science, we just want to present what is in Prabhupada's books. There's another side that says, well, wait a minute, why, if, if we don't care about science and just want to present what's in Prabhupada's books, why did, why did he create the Bhaktivedanta Institute? Why did he put so much emphasis on the importance of showing the correspondence between the Puranic texts and uh, science. Why did he give that so much importance? So there's different perspectives here. And um, the outcome will determine, in large measure, how people see Prabhupada's movement. If it turns out to be something that's too strictly anti-science, then we're going to be seen like Christian fundamentalist creationists, you know, just like a Hindu version of Christian fundamentalism. Mm. On the other side, if we're too deferential to science, well, maybe that's not healthy either. You know, we don't want to give a moral equivalence to reductionist science and the Vedic view. That, that's not our point. So, you know, it has real, what we're talking about has real implications there in this huge project, which will be getting millions of visitors. It already gets millions of visitors every year. On a more intimate scale, on a more personal scale, I meet with youth groups, devotee youth groups, who say to me, I never wanted this. My parents were into it. I was born into it. I don't like it. Or others might say, I like it very much, but I don't understand it. And I don't know how to reconcile the two parts of my life. I feel like I'm going crazy. You know, there's my devotee side, and then I've got my career side, and I want to get married, and I need a job, and, and I don't know how to make it all work. And it's just stressing me out. There's a lot of stress <laughs> in the younger generations in ISKCON over this very issue, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. So, you know, inadvertently, perhaps, Chaitanya Charan, Prabhu, you put your finger on what may be, arguably, the most critical challenge in our society just now. Mm. What will we be tomorrow? What will we be in the future? You know, is it going to be the letter of the law? Or will there be some expansion on that? And what does that look like? Mm. Big, big questions, not small questions. These are big questions. Yeah. So I feel that uh, I, what you said about... Uh, about you know approaching from a platform of compassion and kindness maybe that is that may be ultimately the uh, a key defining principle because sometimes within religious traditions the conviction of our certain certainty can actually erode our humanity because mm. it's it just sometimes I'm certain I'm right and you are wrong so we start dehumanizing other people objectifying, dehumanizing even demonizing sometimes so it's unfortunate that when that kind of rhetoric happens 
because say that the, the the world itself is becoming very polarized and maybe our movement cannot exist like a transcendental bubble the polarization of the outer world will come here also right and there is that well known incident where prabhupada was asked how do we know your disciples and he said they are perfect gentlemen perfect gentlemen ladies so that's an important criteria and because exact specificity about loving krishna or manif or carrying out krishna's mission in the world the specifics we may vary with each other we may even sometimes have strong differences but um, if we approach from that platform of kindness and compassion then maybe aman in amad and as mahaprabhu says offering respects to others maybe yeah. that could decrease the temperature what do you think yeah. <laughs> <Good. laughs> that's a good idea <laughs> yeah no look you know it's a big world out there it takes all kinds to make a movement um i think there's something very sad about saying this is how this is to be interpreted this is the way it is this is what it means i mean really i mean <laughs> I, I, have have you achieved such a high level of 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 omniscience you know and and spiritual purity that you can declare emphatically that your idea is the idea that the entire world should follow mm. <laughs> you know, I, i i think we need to be a little bit more broad minded than that and accept that we might actually be wrong maybe we haven't actually understood this teaching yeah. oh my gosh what an amazing possibility that is to be willing to admit you know i've been chanting hari krishna now for 50 years i still haven't got everything down i'm still learning yes that's an important thing to be able to say look let me give you a simple this is rather silly example but it works um if you change even a comma it'll reverse the meaning of something the teacher said the student is a fool the teacher comma said the student comma is a fool now oh, beautiful and the teacher said the student is a fool <laughs> <laughs> you know, by adding a little comma completely opposite meaning mm. you know what to speak of you know complex sophisticated ideas of the different moods of love and and so on you know i'm i because i'm trying to write a biography of mahaprabhu which is very presumptuous of me i'm reading a lot of different biographies you know lochan das morari gupta and uh, brindavan das and so on and and prabhupad told me to do that he said you should read the you should read the books um and he mentioned chaitanya bhagavat which he had not translated mm. if when you read these other books each each book has its own particular emphasis you know lochan das comes at things a little bit more some tantric ideas in there a little bit of what we might call sahaja um murari gupta who wrote his kavacha is that the word while chaitanya was still in the world it's more like a concise summary of things it doesn't go into great detail mm. vrindavan das it's all about these amazing pastimes you know elaborate description of pastimes up through the middle years Krishna das Kaviraj Goswami high philosophy the whole adi lila you know the whole first volume is establishing panchatattva what's called the mangala charana the energies of the supreme being and so on each biography has its own particular orientation and doesn't mean that one is right and the other is wrong it's different perspective on thing Krishna can be seen from a variety of perspectives. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu can seen, be seen from a variety of perspectives. 
Mm. Imagine the challenge here, how to make Chaitanya Mahaprabhu relevant to non-devotees in the 21st century. That's the challenge. Yeah. It's the most difficult thing I've ever tried to do. If I just stick to the letter of the law, if I just stick to the concrete codified pastimes in the books, I don't see how anyone's going to understand anything. And I, you know, I'm, I'm challenged by this, by trying to understand the spirit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is a daily, you know, the subject that you've brought up is a daily exercise for me. Um, on that level. <clears throat> so in one sense, uh, what you're doing it is, uh, maybe it's, it's extending much, much broader. You're going deep into the tradition and you are going deep into the contemporary world also. Because in, in one sense, you're trying to reach out to people who will, who may not come to ever come to a temple or who may not hear about Mahaprabhu from any of the traditional sources because they're not interested in the traditional sources. But in another sense, actually anybody who's trying to share bhakti wisdom has to do these things. I sometimes okay. like, <laughs> like to, I like to give the metaphor of a mridanga. That when we are trying to present wisdom, those who are liberals beat us from one side. You're not liberal enough. <laughs> and those who are conservatives, they beat from the other side. You're not being conservative enough. And Either way, you're going to get beaten up. Yeah, and while we beat us from both sides, we still have to produce some <laughs> sweet sound. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm. yeah. Mahaprabhu never talked about the environment. You know, he, he didn't talk about climate change. True. But, but he did talk about how we may be mistaken in how we define life and what is our relationship with the natural world. So maybe in the spirit of his teachings, mm -hmm. it's possible to make the connection with ecology. Right. Yes. Right. True. It is. So that's, you know, the kind of approach, if you will. It's a beautiful example. It's, but, uh, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. I was, when I was speaking on the Namodar Ashtakam, I was thinking that it is easy to explain it to Indians. But if a completely new <laughs> Western person is coming and then they have to do, we offer, ask them to offer a lamp, maybe they will do it. I was in Singapore and we were speaking to an audience of primarily Chinese people. And they just, it's a completely different culture that the Chinese expatriates, many of them settled in Singapore. But I realized that uh, what is so relishable for us as devotees can come off as completely incomprehensible. Maybe uh, out, of, <laughs> out of deference, they might just do the ritual of offering a lamp. That's right. But you have to actually explain the past time. It is quite complex. <laughs> people, like, can you imagine people looking at us? What, what, the, what they must think? What? <laughs> What are these people doing? <laughs> I told I told you this story that when you know when I came out of living in temples for thirteen years and went to visit my mom, she said, "You know, when you were in the temple, I thought the food was very nice. I liked the food. The music was fine. But what was that thing about dressing the dolls? Dressing the dolls, okay." <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for people, you know, to look at our habits and culture and, and really have an appreciation for it. It's a bit of a challenge, you know, to, to make all of this relevant for people. I mean, that, but that's our job, isn't it? Mm. That's, that's what we're called upon to do. So, oh. look, I don't think the future is going to be a repeat of the past. I can tell you that uh, my my sense of the future of Chaitanya Vaishnavism or Krishna consciousness, if you will, it's not going to be just what we've known in the first 55 years or whatever it's been. I think it's going to be very, very different in many respects. I mean, the basics will be there. You know, the basics always have to be there to maintain purity. But I think the shape of it will be quite different from what we've seen before. And I think that's what we're meant to do. I think 
the mandate, the challenge, the assignment that we've been given by our predecessor Acharyas is to go into the future and experiment with the application of the teachings into areas where we have not been active before. We haven't been very active in politics, we haven't been very active in the peace process or uh, alleviating poverty or health and wellness, you know, but as, as our, as Prabhupada's movement grows, these, we're entering into these areas, you know, there are large communities of devotee physicians, large communities of devotee scientists, large communities of devotee therapists and care people, you know, social workers, and they're beginning to experiment with the connecting links between their career path, their calling in the world, and the teachings that we have to offer. <clears throat> mm. So that's very exciting. That's very exciting. That transition of, you want to call it the, the letter of the scriptures or the spirit of the scriptures, not either or, but the, the maturing of both the letter and the spirit. Mm. the maturing of both those things in the world to, to come, you know. It's beautiful. Both mature, both are mature, that's true. Actually, if you think about the future, it's so difficult to even think of where the world will be in 10, 15, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, the way it is changing. So, if we try to bring a structure from the past and impose it on a world which is even rejecting structures that were 5 years or 10 years or 20 years old. I mean, it is going to be, maybe we are making our task much more difficult than what it needs to be. Of course, some people can say that because we are rejecting the current structures, that's why people will be more receptive to the ancient structures. But it's difficult to envision that. So, Maybe a certain, what you said earlier, I don't know. Maybe I haven't understood this fully. And maybe there is room for improving my learning also. That learning attitude can help us navigate the complex and un unpredictable future that we are encountering. Yeah. I remember <clears throat> something that, <clears throat> excuse me, hmm. Tamal Krishna Maharaj said just a couple of weeks before he had his tragic accident. He was a real visionary. Tamal Krishna was a, he saw things faster than almost anybody else among Prabhupada's disciples. Brilliant, brilliant man. He, he said that uh, if we really want to see Prabhupada's movement move forward, we have to be prepared to stand it on its head. Mm. Now that's, <laughs> that's worth some discussion. But what he meant by that is we, we have to be willing to revisit all of our assumptions about what our role is in society. We have to be prepared to admit that maybe we've had a misimpression about how deep into the work of the world we're meant to go. Because I believe his understanding and, and mine is that the answer is all the way. All the way into society we're not meant to be on the margins hanging out waiting for people that when the time comes when they're totally frustrated with their material life then they'll find us out that's a passive view of the sankirtan mission an active view of the sankirtan mission would be to say where are people living how can we reach them where they are mm. People will come to appreciate us, not just because they've seen Harinam on the streets, but when, in addition to that, they will speak with representatives of Krishna consciousness who have a contribution to make to their particular field of inquiry, of vocation, of action in society, 
and people begin to realize, wow, we need to bring these people in on our think tanks. We need to bring these people in on the decision-making discussions on the big issues of the world. Now we're starting to get someplace. Now we're starting to get to get somewhere. Mm. But that takes a willingness to say, to change our habits and stop this idea that, well, we own the truth. And all that these other people have to do is just listen to what we have to say and get on board with our program. Mm. We're not going to get very far if that's our attitude. Mm. So now I think you're taking a much deeper take on this that it's, uh, it's in fact, how do we define outreach itself? And we have discussed this earlier. Is it that outreach is simply in terms of uh, getting people to chant Hare Krishna and coming to the practices of bhakti? Or is it making them also receptive to uh, to broader world views, which they can incorporate in their present level also and move forward and live a little more more informed, wiser life. So those, if you want to reach out to those people, then the letter of the law may be may be completely irrelevant for them. If you think if practicing bhakti means you have to come to a level of chanting sixteen rounds. Somebody may be very open to the bhakti worldview, but may not be ready to chant. Can we accommodate them also? Am I just am I uh, echoing to some extent what you are thinking of when you are saying this point? <clears throat> yes, it's it's in the right direction. <clears throat> I would take it even further than that, though. Okay. I would take it to the point of saying, let's say someone comes to a temple. And they listen, they attend some presentations, and they get interested. Then they, So they come up to you one day, and they say, you know, Chaitanya Charan, I work for the Federal Reserve. I have the ear of the chairman of the Federal Reserve. I actually am in a position where I can influence economic policy for the entire United States. What's your advice to me? Sorry, you're asking me. <laughs> <laughs> you're putting me on the defense. <laughs> now, but, but t seriously, take that story, and now someone else comes up to you and says, you know, Chaitanya Charan, um, I've been coming to the temple. I haven't told any of my colleagues that I come here because um, I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the chairman of the Republican National Convention. And I have the opportunity to shape the agenda of the Republican Party for the next presidential election. Do you have any advice for me? I mean, we can go on and on and on. Someone comes up to you and says, Chaitanya Charan, you know, I've been uh, listening to some of the things you've said in your podcast, and I'm, I'm very interested in this. Um, I'm the director of research for the National Science Foundation in its division that works with um, stem cell uh, recombinant uh, uh, genetic research. Do you have any advice for me? Well, this could actually, I'm just thinking, this could actually uh, open a whole new universe in exploring what all ways uh, our wisdom could be made relevant. Because... Uh, isn't, isn't it about time that we started doing that? Yeah. In, in one sense, in Back to God, we had a Vedic Observer column very comment on current issues. But often the conclusion is, okay, we are not the body, we are the soul, and if you chant Hare Krishna, that is the solution. It, it, it becomes a little bit predictable and uh, not so practical solution for those who are not insiders or not ready to become insiders. But in each of these points you mentioned, we could, we could do this like a thought exercise and we could do a separate podcast on this also. The, if, absolutely. If we had something like this, now we are... 
we would say that, that this is the only thing we could speak. We could have two, three different approaches and there are other devotees who might have different approaches, but at least to get ourselves to start thinking in that direction. It's so important. Mm -hmm. We can't clearly give just the standard Krishna conscious do's and don'ts at that level. That's not going to be at all relevant to them. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about this. We could, we could plan <laughs> something in future. So look, so here, I'm going to do what you do. Let me summarize. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So what we've so what we've said uh, is very interesting. What we have said is that <clears throat> in exploring the letter of the law, or the letter of scripture versus the spirit of scripture, we've said that um, it's a big world and both things are needed. And we've also discussed how maybe we don't actually understand what is the letter of the scripture, because it is constantly evolving because its application in the world is constantly changing, nor do we fully understand what is the spirit of the law, because that too is in a state of constant evolution. So there needs to be some sense of context. And when we look to the future of the application of these teachings, uh, it may not be just a repeat of what's happened in the past. We may be on the verge right now of the most exciting moment in the entire history of Chaitanya Vaishnavism. Imagine for the moment that we are on the cusp of an entire new era of penetration of bhakti teachings in the world. How would we go about implementing that? If the opportunities were presented, we have to anticipate those opportunities and be prepared for them. You know, if, if um, Mark Zuckerberg were to come to you and say, you know, I've been listening to some of your podcasts and recently I've changed Facebook. I call it now Meta. I have a new company. It's called Meta. Mm. And the whole idea of meta is that I want to take the internet from two-dimensional to three-dimensional content. And what that is going to do is give people a completely immersive, interactive experience where they can, through an avatar, live any kind of a life that they want to live. Do you have any advice for me? Now, this, this, this is a real situation. I'm not just inventing this. Mark Zuckerberg is spending, spending something along the lines of $10 billion a year to reinvent the internet through his company Meta, which is a reference to the metaverse, meaning that his goal is to get the entire world capable of interacting simultaneously in real time, creating whatever kind of environment their imagination can think of and then of course they can buy stuff to fit it <laughs> you know because your avatar has to have two thousand dollar sneakers and a ten thousand dollar gucci wardrobe right okay, yeah. so it's, it's all about commerce mm. but imagine you know if you were if we were being given those kinds of opportunities what would we do with them i i my position is i don't think we have a clue because we never talk about it and we don't know what the application of bhakti is in that larger world. We never think about it. So our view of our mission has been terribly narrow, terribly, terribly, terribly narrow. The time has come. It's not too late, but it's almost too late. The time has come to broaden our vision, to come at the work of Prabhupada's society from a mentality of wealth, from a mentality of opportunity, from a mentality of we have a role to play in the larger unfolding of the future of the world. What will we do with it? This gives such an exciting way of looking at uh, 
current affair instead of just seeing them as just just mundane events no connection with krishna but we try to envision how we can connect this with krishna actually one of the th- when i was reading the bhagavad gita recently it struck me that when we t- that you know making a contemporary outreach it doesn't just mean we take scripture and try to present it in contemporary ways it also means that krishna is time so how krishna is acting in contemporary ways in the world that could also be another aspect of krishna consciousness that, that's it <clears throat> yeah so this is beautiful bro let's Dude, we should one. never we should never allow our own teachings our own culture our own scriptures to limit us mm-hmm. in our effort to achieve the mission of the acharyas mm-hmm. what a tragedy that is that you become so locked in to this calcified idea of well this is devotional service that's not devotional service this is the letter of the law that's not the letter of the law this is the spirit that's not this we become so locked into these perspectives that we miss the whole exciting adventure of what it is we've been given a chance to do mm. that's so true. yes more discussion is needed much more yeah. discussion that's true i will let's plan some topic and uh, we can take it forward so just to is to reiterate what what the summary mentioned that we talked about the letter of script the letter of scripture may and the spirit of scripture may differ because what is scripture if we consider scripture as not just words in a book but wisdom that is coming from krishna then both we are evolving and that's why what, what the wisdom we find in scripture can change and also krishna himself is dynamic so what he is revealing through scripture at different times may also change and then we could if we reduce scripture to only its letter the relevance will become very limit, limited if we use scripture to fulfill our own agenda then scripture may get lost so when we are having differences they often are differences in what what the teaching of scripture is or what its spirit behind the letter is then then we have to look more at our nature because even when somebody wants to preserve the tradition and they say this is the letter we should stick to sometimes there are different letters different words in scripture and which words to emphasize when that is also a decision that is taken so that that the same debate comes in uh, interpretation of the us constitution in i think it's originalism versus or it's constitu- living constitutionalism or something like that those mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. so that is a very vibrant debate and then you give the example of your attempts to say see what would mahaprabhu's teachings about climate change and the environment be and that requires or the drawing deep inside the tradition but reaching out to the contemporary world also and possibly just retaining a attitude of kindness and uh, compassion is what will help us to at least not become uh, fanatically confrontational uh, do not lose our humanity in dealing with confrontations and then we need to go beyond the letter of scripture to the spirit if we are to reach what uh, could be called the unchurched audience or those who don't come to the temples so you get three four thought scenarios which are just so exciting like somebody wants to know how what guidelines could be important corporate stem cell research on the republican convention charter or republic national convention charter or things like that this is this is amazing So I look forward to more podcasts, which are more thought exercises with specific current issues. Pro, are there any points you would like to add in conclusion? I, I'm looking forward to our next conversation as well. Yes, bro. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank